Welcome to another episode of the Bowden Education Podcast with me, your host, Catherine Carden. We take time in these podcasts to talk to people who are committed to making a positive and transformational impact in education. Our autumn series showcases educational professionals who are truly committed to their work and whose work is vital for those working in education. Today, I'm delighted to be talking to Sarah Watkins. Sarah started off in the charity sector and then retrained to become a primary school teacher. She's taught every year group from nursery to year six and became assistant head leading English in 10 schools. Sarah was then made head of school at the school she attended as a child. That must have been surreal and lovely, I'm sure, and slightly <laughs> odd at the same time. <laughs> Sarah went on to teach GCSE English, is now an associate lecturer at the University of Worcester. She's taught on undergraduate and postgraduate courses there. Sarah is the author of two books published by Routledge, one on outdoor play and well-being and one on sustainability. And both of those we'll mention but are on our Bowden Education website, so you can go and have a look. Sarah is a forest school leader and this year started her own outdoor play company called Dandelions, where children get to use tools, cook on the fire and make shelters, as well as devising their own play challenges. Wow. Um, Sarah, you've got so much that I'd love to chat to you about. And so we're going to crack on because there's so many questions buzzing around in my head. And I may well come back to how was it leading your old primary school school in a bit. But <laughs> I've given a summary. Is there anything else that you'd like to chuck in the mix about your career today? Well, thank you so much for having me, Catherine. It feels like a, a real privilege to be on this podcast. I always listen with interest. Um, I mean, I suppose it's the sort of portfolio career that's becoming so popular these days. And I think when I was younger, I never thought that was an option. Um, I just kind of thought, you know, my career would take a very linear path. Um, I did think I'd work in the charity sector forever, really. And then as I was going into schools, I worked as an arts officer as well for the local authority. And I was going into schools and my role was to kind of bring the curriculum to life with arts projects. And I thought, oh, this is what being a primary teacher is all about. Uh, obviously, when I did then retrain to be a primary teacher, I realised there was a lot more to it. Um, but I found it rewarding in so many different ways. But I think there's a thread that runs through all of the different careers that I've had, really, and that's sort of collaborating and, and making a difference. It sounds like a cliche, but I do think that's true. Um, and one of the things I'm really pleased about is that I've sort of maintained my ethos. So sometimes when I've worked in a setting where I felt all oh, people in senior leadership, you know, the ethos isn't really aligned to mine or, or there's quite a distance between their ethos and their values and my own. Um, you know, I, I moved on. And in some situations, I was I felt under pressure to kind of change my values and, and change my practice to the detriment of children. Um, and I resisted that. And that's not always easy. And I'm sure some listeners will have been in that situation. So that's something I'm really pleased about. Um, but when I do look at my CV, I think, gosh, there's been a lot of changes. You know, every few years I've, I've changed careers. But I, I, I suppose I do really enjoy that challenge, um, getting in with a new team and addressing new challenges. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think I think now I think like you, I probably thought because I think we're probably of a, a similar age that when we left school, you you go to university, you do your career and that's the career that you choose. Now it's completely different. And I think younger people are much more open to a portfolio career. I can remember being advised, you know, um, by someone that about you know the the old thing in your cv that you shouldn't be too choppy and changey because that raises questions now i think there's more questions raised if you haven't got variety in your cv because people are looking for you to bring more than just i can do that job because look i've been doing a similar job for the last 25 years so i do think it's more exciting now I do remember what you're saying about, uh, you know, and I do have that in the back of my mind. It was said a lot, you know, when we were younger, you know, or you're, you, know, you shouldn't have too many changes on your career, uh, on your CV. Um, that, as you say, it looks bad if there's been that choppy, changey kind of uh, situation. But you're absolutely right. And I, I, you know, my son's there 18 and 21, and they very much see 
um, the reality now as, as you would probably need to make a lot of changes and, you know, have a flexible career path in, in that sense. You know, they're not so much thinking, well, this is the job that I'll do for the rest of my life. So I think, yeah, there's definitely changes in perspective. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's a good thing. So um, anyway, so what what inspires and drives you to continue working in education? Because we hear so much about how it's really challenging environment now for all manner of reasons. But what keeps you going? I mean, it is a cliche and I have already mentioned it, but I think making a difference has been sort of key through all of my different types of work in education. So uh, working in the informal education sector. So when I started off working for a charity for Rural Media, we'd, uh, we were doing much more of a youth work role. So we'd go across the country uh, working with people who are disadvantaged by their race or uh, by their gender or different issues. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and, you know, that was very much about making relationships and giving them a platform, really. And I've definitely seen that, you know, so I've used that in FE as well. So I was teaching people who had failed their GCSE, um, but there were so many different sort of factors to that and, and the background to that could be quite complex. So often those young people had been told throughout their life they were failures and they had failed. So it's very much about building a relationship with them and again, giving them a platform saying, you know, I do want to listen to you. Uh, and making them feel that they were valued um, and then going you know teaching in early years and at the moment working with dandelion so uh, it's sort of informal education with mainly very young children making them feel that they do matter they are included uh, and we do want to hear their views even at a very young age at age two mm. but also you know the young people that I'm working with aged 18 plus um, you know that's so important and I find Simon Sinek's work really interesting I don't know if you've yes you're nodding I love him yes <laughs> I was talking to a group in London the other day of early years educators and saying you know what is your why uh, as he goes through that and they were finding that quite interesting you know so he talks about when are you at your best and I when I thought about that I, I know I'm really at my best when I'm collaborating with other people when I'm hands-on I know I'm I'm pretty good when I'm outside and helping other people realize their potential and then he says, well, when are you at your worst? And when I'm working with student teachers, of course, that's the one area they're really good at identifying, you know, what, what their worst at, what their areas of development are. Sometimes it's making them look more, you know, what they're best at. Um, so I know I'm not so good in meetings, you know, when I'm stifled or restricted. Um, you know, admin isn't really my favourite thing. We all have to do it. But, you know, what you're passionate about, you know, he says to think about that. I know I'm really passionate about children learning outside. Uh, and when he talks about, you know, when you feel most energized, that's when I'm outside. When I was doing forest school in primary schools, I was outside thinking, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. And that's when I thought perhaps, you know, I could make that part of my career uh, with dandelions. Mm -hmm. And I think his questions when he says, what is your core purpose of your role and why does it matter? They're quite simple questions. But when we were talking about this in London the other day, there's so much there. And these early years practitioners, you know, they're thinking you know, you, you sort of think, oh, yes, it's quite obvious what the core purpose of my role is. But actually, when you think about it, there's so much there to delve into. Um, I mean, for me, I'm really thinking about developing people's emotional and physical well-being. Um, and my husband, who's not a teacher, has never been in education. He says, you know, it's life changing, you know, what you're doing. He says, as an outsider, mm -hmm. everybody who's working in education is changing lives. And he sees how important it is, which is great. <laughs> Good. And going, yeah, I, I smiled at uh, Simon Sinek's work and I I was working with a head of department in Effie actually just this week and I've sent him the link to exactly that talk. And I said, right, this is where he started with the why talk and you need to watch this and then start delving into his other work. But this is what that really catapulted him into to the sort of... Um, the public eye I suppose but I did see and I haven't yet managed to um, catch it I did see on LinkedIn advertise Brenny Brown's podcast a conversation with her Simon Sinek and Adam Grant oh that sounds like my right. dream podcast <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm really <laughs> nervous about you know a big presentation or something I always listen to Brené first yeah. and she just grounds you and makes you feel like you've got something important to say you know because sometimes I can feel like a, an imposter doing presentations and I think actually you know I'm just sharing my experience and there's some value in that and Brené really helps you believe that <laughs> yeah and Adam Grant's also great so um it's on it's on my list to uh, do and I will put in the podcast notes the link to the um Simon Sinek uh why 
talk because it, it does get you thinking, doesn't it? It does. So moving on to um, early years, really, now, and um, I read your recent Nursery World article, which I think is really fascinating just to start thinking about risk and hazard and conversations around, you know, uh, people call it the cotton wool generation and all of this. But you're clearly an advocate for children in the early years exploring the outdoors. Why is that so important? Well, you were talking just now about uh, my experience being head of school in my old primary school. It was, as you say, it was surreal. Um, and it, it was a, a quite strange, unique experience, but wonderful, because it was a very tiny primary school um, in a very rural area. I was born in London and my parents decided to relocate um, when we were quite little uh, and they moved to the middle of nowhere. Uh, we, we were treated with a little bit of, uh, I was going to say disdain, maybe cynicism in our village. My dad had very long hair. You know, my parents were quite alternative. And I think they were quite shocked by this group of hippies that had moved to the countryside. But, you know, my childhood, um, you know, was very much characterised by being outside all the time. That's what my parents believed in. Um, and I think in those days, you know, it was much more the case that we were outside and left to our own devices a lot more. Um, you know, there's a a lot more fearfulness now. I mean, in my book, I talk about a case study where a grandmother who took her grandson to the woods uh, was not arrested, but someone called the police because they said it seemed suspicious. And they were just building a den in the woods. Uh, and a police officer came into the woods and escorted her back out of the woods. And she's written about this in The Guardian. And I thought, gosh, that's so shocking, really, when they're doing such a, what we would think of such a normal activity when I was a child. Um, so I think, you know, my own experience of my childhood, um, when I turned up at my at my old primary school and introduced myself as head of school, one of the four year olds came running up to me and said, do you know where the, the really good hiding place is? And I said, I do. I do know where it is. And I went out. She was really surprised that I knew. And it's just this little area behind a big bush outside. And I thought for generations, this has been passed on. And mm -hmm. um, so when I think of my own childhood, I remember, you know, how healthy that was. Uh, but we know through the research, even before the pandemic, uh, before the lockdown, sorry, in the pandemic, um, sensory dysfunction has been on the rise. This has been written about, you know, comprehensively. I love the book Balanced and Barefoot by Angela Hanscom, where she describes the research that she's um, identified as an occupational therapist. So we're seeing these huge issues around the, around the globe, sorry, with myopia, difficulties with core strength uh, and muscle groups. And this is really linked to limited time outdoors for children. And I'm seeing with older young people, you know, the mental health issues that seem to be resulting from this lack of time outdoors. Um, I mean, we're seeing huge levels of inactivity and obviously obesity is still on the rise. It's still an issue. It has been for so long. I mean, I love, I've been looking at rewilding, which hasn't been invested in as much as I'd like it to be with, you know, the current government. But the definition is restoring ecosystems to the point where nature can take care of itself. And I think there's an analogy there with children being outdoors. You know, we want them to be able to, you know, have that independence. Um, and it's about restoring our relationship with the natural world. And I find sometimes I'm actually establishing a relationship with children in the natural world. You know, I have very young children coming to me who are only used to walking on tarmac mm. uh, and they get very fearful about uneven ground. Um, and it's also about reconnecting what with what matters rewilding. And I think that whole description of rewilding is... It, it very much uh, describes, you know, children's relationships with the outdoors and what it should be like. And those green space are protective as well. You know, they're great. They, or they can be great for people, for example, with ADHD. So 20 minutes outside can be the same as a dose of Ritalin. Obviously, mm. every person is unique and individual. Um, but tree cover leads to um, less asthma symptoms. Uh, and it's an inclusive uh, environment as well so children can choose their own challenges and devise them we see that every day with dandelions when children are in a wild space and I think it's even for adults because we need to lead the way don't we we need to model what young people should be doing there's very little point in parents sitting saying go outside if all the child sees are their parents sat on the sofa or, or whatever and I think it's it's never too late to change your habits. So we're talking about young people and getting young children out and and the impact that that has on their health. And that is the same for old pe older people. And it's never too late. I I too love the outdoors. And in, and and you it doesn't matter how much time you spend up 
outside, there are always new experiences to have that can be profound on and impact your well-being, your sense of happiness, your sense of self. And I was just thinking as you were talking there about I was on holiday in the summer in the Alps and um, I go to this place regularly and to walk and we were walking up the mountain and um, a golden eagle flew over my head. Now, I wasn't sure whether to kind of squeal with excitement or absolute fear because they're immense. And then just around the corner, there was a, a marmot. They're kind of like um, mountain land beaver kind of things, about the size of a beaver kind. And it was just joyous. And I keep thinking about it now, about the joy of just sat looking at this, this marmot and the golden eagle. And I, I'm so st still enthused about those moments that were just magical. And it is about allowing people to experience those magical moments absolutely and it's so healthy for children to experience the different seasons and something I find when I'm talking to dif different settings is some people will say well some of our staff are really reluctant to get outside and that can be a huge barrier and also parents and carers can be a bit of a barrier so a lot of settings say to me well, we get a lot of complaints and when I was head of school you know I've been in senior leadership I know that's not easy you know that was a huge part of my job I was responsible obviously for dealing with any complaints um, and, you know, sometimes it was just sitting down with people uh, and talking through the benefits and also making sure children have the right clothing and also adults having the right clothing. So, you know, adults are a lot less miserable outside when they've got truly waterproof clothing, for example, because it is miserable if you're freezing cold and you're wet. You know, I can understand that. Mm. Yeah. So that brings me on nicely because some teachers do worry about the potential risks maybe just it could be a risk but it could be a complaint in your recent article um, that I mentioned in Nursery World you say the aim shouldn't be to create a risk-free environment though so why because lots of people will be I'll take them out but I need to remove the, the risk and that could be a teacher it could be a parent but why shouldn't we it, I mean, it is our role to keep children safe. I mean, that that is, you know, the predominantly important thing. And uh, so last night I was working with um, young children at the after school club using tools, um, but we've trained them, you know, uh, we have the safety equipment that they need. Um, but then there is still a risk, you know, but I, I think... I mean, it's interesting that the health and safety executive are often falsely quoted. And I know they get really annoyed about this. I mean, fake news. I heard someone saying the other day, all of course, conkers are banned. You know, you can't play conkers at schools anymore. That was never banned by the health and safety executive. Uh, toilet rolls. Someone said to me, of course, you know, you can't use those in class. I said, no, that's completely false as well. Um, you know, that that say they suggest that you microwave them for a short period of time to remove any germs but there's been so many I think myths about uh you know from people saying that that's what the health and safety executive have asked for uh, but they say themselves the goal is not to eliminate risk it's to weigh up the risks and the benefits uh, and they say no child will learn about risk if they're wrapped up in cotton wool you talked earlier about you know what's referred to as the cotton wool culture um, and I think, you know, children do need exposure to a certain level of risk. In my book, I talk about productive uncertainty. My husband's a financial advisor and we had to, in one of the lockdowns, sort of share the same room to, to work from home. And I heard him talking about this on the phone. I have no clue what it means in terms of the markets, the financial markets. But for me, you know, they need productive uncertainty in the outside environment. Um, so children need access to some kind of obstacle. So things like logs or an unusual topography, so slopes. Uh, and if you if you have space for that or take children to a space like that not a sort of manicured all on one level environment uh, I mean something I noticed in my local area was when we had um, a fallen tree the storm brought down this really ancient old oak tree uh, and it fell in the middle of this housing estate and they were really angry about it the local residents wanted it removed um, but then they noticed that the children the local children were starting to play on this uh, and right next to it is a play area every time I've gone past there no one is playing on the sort of standardized play equipment they're all playing on this tree and the local community have now campaigned successfully to keep this here I mean and children know what they need for their minds and their bodies they need to have uh, these more unusual obstacles for their physical and emotional well-being 
And people do say that there can be some danger with sort of standardized play equipment because the play becomes quite simplified and the child doesn't worry about their movements. They know that there's always this equidistant uh, gap between the steps and they get used to that. Mm. So it's making sure they develop physically in an appropriate way. And also that sort of risky play gives children those really important opportunities to learn about uncertainty and fear and experience a wide range of emotions. And then they're more easily able as they're older to take healthy risks and, and to deal with anxiety and fear provoking situations. So scientists have found uh, that there's a rise, or researchers sorry, found that there's a rise in anxiety and fear amongst children. And at the same time, they're having less experience of, exper of situations where they can experience fear and anxiety in a safe environment. So with the support of adults. Um, so they're becoming more overwhelmed there. And if we're all always stepping in, then children get into that habit of always turning to an adult in these vulnerable situations. And then they find it difficult to cope when they're getting into these challenging situations as they get older. Yeah. And, and making the right judgment call as well. If they've never had to make a judgment call, at some point, they're either never going to take any risk or they're going to struggle when they need to, to make a decision. But we do perceive risk differently so when I was reading um it was about you were talking about teachers considering the risk and how we we do perceive risk differently so I might see something as quite risky that you kind of know that's absolutely fine so take something quite extreme for example I watch climbing or you know those insane climbers and they put that tent out on the side of the rock. yes <laughs> makes me want to be physically sick because I have a fear of falling down so when I'm up in the mountains I really do struggle with crossing over crevasses and going to the edge but other clearly they go to sleep in those tents so that's an extreme example but we do um perceive risk differently so how what are the key things you would say to a teacher about assessing hazards and risks are there any sort of rules of thumb that can I don't know uh, bring it down to more even keel no, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, there is a scale. And I know that some people would see um, that I'm more comfortable taking risks, but I know other people who um, perhaps take risks that I'm not as comfortable with. Um, so, yeah, there's I mean, studies have shown that just like children, we all perceive risk in a different way. Um, so when they did some research, they found that even subconsciously people were making different decisions. So and we can't avoid that subconscious bias. We've got to be really careful of that. I think the first step is being aware of that uh, and understanding that that is the case. Um, so it's always important to bring in different perspectives. So as a sole trader, I've got other people that I work with, you know, just to sort of check, you know, how do you feel about this? Because it can be quite hard when you're working on your own. But when I was a school leader, uh, I mean, it's part of our policy writing, you know, we always involve different members of staff. So you might get three other members of staff to, to comment on your risk assessment policy, which is, you know, really good. And it's good if that's a healthy discussion. I mean, you know, I've worked in some settings where it's like, yep, sign off on that. That's it. It should be a dynamic working document if you've got a risk assessment policy. It shouldn't be something that's just, you know, saved and nobody really knows the content of it or they don't feel ownership of it. Communication is really key. Um, so you have got to be really honest about it. And when you're talking about heights, when I was um, in Italy, we were walking around this wall town um, called Cittadella. Uh, and there was only a very sort of thin wire around it, not a, not a fence as such. You know, we had the children, they were quite young. Uh, and at one point, my husband stopped and just shouted, don't. And I thought, why is she shouting this? And my son had actually been contemplating jumping about 50 foot onto a nearby tree. <laughs> and I was thinking, why would that even cross your mind? He was really young at the time. But my husband felt much more comfortable in that situation. He's often more comfortable with the boys and be, being in more risky situations, whereas I just, you know, imagine everything that could go wrong. So I think it's, yeah, it's working as a team and realizing you have those different uh, perspectives. I think with parents, that can be quite tricky. I mean, the communication needs to be really um, consistent, I'd say, you know, so, you know, as head of school, working with parents and carers, sometimes I'd find that parents, because I had a really good relationship with them and I built that over time, uh, they would come to me and sometimes make really useful suggestions. So, you know, one parent said to me, oh, you do realise that's giant hogweed, you know, growing quite close to there. And I hadn't noticed it was sort of around the corner of the school building, not actually on our premises, but close by. 
Um, so the, the local authority were able to come and remove that for us. Um, sometimes parents and carers would come and say, well, you know, I'm not happy about children pay, playing in the rain or uh, I want them kept away from puddles. And in that situation, I'd explain what our ethos was and the benefits and the, you know, explain about the clothing that we had. So it's having that discussion. Um, but I mean, you have to realise that parents on the whole are just concerned about their child's own safety. And it's it's pointless to dismiss people's fears. As a parent, I wouldn't want that. I would want a discussion about it and I want to be heard. And I think, you know, that's the most important thing. They just want clear communication, uh, which is really important. But I think what can be really confusing, and I, I know lots of people got tied into knots over the lockdowns. It was really stressful for people in education who were making those decisions about risk assessments. Um, but the terms hazard and risk can be really confusing. And I think that's a really good starting point. So understanding that a hazard is something that might cause harm. So, you know, an uncovered pond. I spoke to somebody who took over a setting uh, and had an uncovered well in their nursery, which was really deep, which they had to <laughs> have covered up. It was completely uncovered. And I thought, gosh, that yeah, that's definitely a hazard. Um, and then risk is about the probability and, com and consequence. So it's the chance, high or low, that someone will be harmed by that hazard. And there's lots of different ways of, you know, completing those risk assessments. So in early years, dynamic risk assessment is what we do all the time. So we're constantly, uh, you know, observing what's going on. We've got our risk assessment policies in place already, uh, but then dynamically assessing what's going on. Um, and a lot of us in early years are now using risk benefit analysis. That's pretty well known now. So thinking about the benefits of an activity, not just the risks. And some settings are now putting the benefits first. So they're thinking about the benefits first and then identifying the risks. Um, and there will be some hazards, like I'm working in quite a few mobile, I, I'll just turn up to a site and I might be working in Parkland, for example. So before the children arrive, um, I'll be looking for things like cigarette butts or uh, litter, broken glass, things like that. Uh, and that's an obvious hazard with no benefit. Uh, but then when I'm working with tools, I'm sort of thinking, well, there are risks to using the drill, for example, or the saw um, and tools like that, hammers. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about what the benefits are. So identifying, you know, how to keep children safe, how to train them, the right equipment to have, uh, but also identifying that there are benefits there. If there are no benefits, then, you know, there isn't really much point in carrying on with it, but it's involving children in that process as well. Mm. And I think as well as, as a teacher, it's, it, and you said about collaborative working on risk assessments, and it is sometimes about overcoming your own fears because it's really easy to not do things because you don't maybe you're not fearful you just don't like doing them so yeah, I yeah. won't do it so for me if someone said patter it's patter rat day someone's bringing in you know, <laughs> no no there are many many risks about we can't do this I'm with you Catherine I'm with you on them <laughs> <laughs> but um and again that's a bit of a, a silly but you know as so often as adults and this is parents as well your own fears and your your worries are deflected on your own own children and and what they do just because I have a ridiculous phobia of rats and mice I don't know why <laughs> I have you know it well that shouldn't hopefully be then pushed onto others so it's it's really hard isn't it if you're uncomfortable as well and you're yeah, leading think, the session yeah and I think it's linked to your own experiences as well I mean a friend of mine the worst accident she ever witnessed in over 30 years of working with children was a child who fell on their scooter so pulled the scooter with them it's it was awful the handle went through their their cheek and they obviously had to go to hospital have surgery eventually they were fine but of course you wouldn't ban scooters but you know, it's now in your mind that this could happen. And I know when I was an NQT, um, I was aware that at the school I was at, something had happened with the skipping rope. Well, the child was eventually fine, but it was an extremely scary situation. Uh, wasn't my class. It wasn't something I was directly involved in. But, you know, having heard of that, that really made me nervous in the future about ropes and skipping ropes and really aware of, of the danger. So I think if you've come across certain experiences, you know, um, and I think also you've got to acknowledge you know, safety is paramount. So when I was in reception, sometimes, um, you know, at some points a day, you, you wouldn't have a TA. So you've got 30 children, you're on your own, and they're very young children, especially in September, you know, they've just started. 
Um, in that situation, sometimes, for example, I'd be limiting outdoor play. Now, I'm the person who's, you know, shouting strongly as an advocate for outdoor play. Um, but if you're, you know, the situation where I was in, um, you know, we had I had to limit certain areas. So if I was totally on my own with 30 children, you know, I had to think about their safety. So ideally, you know, to have more adults with you. But, you know, the the funding for schools is is getting more and more difficult. And, and that's that's a real barrier. So, and, you know, TAs are becoming a, a, a scarce resource. They are indeed. So moving on then, and just tying this up a little bit, it's what would you say then are your top tips to manage risk, yet encourage independence? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I said, communication is really key. So you've got to ensure that everybody in the setting understands the ethos and they're all on board. I do think it's really important to involve children in the um, assessment of risk. You know, hazards are a part of life. So we do need to train children um, to, to help themselves stay safe. Um, and the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents, they say that we're really good as, as educators about saying to children about staying safe in specific situations. So, you know, I, I know as a reception teacher, I was always saying in, in a case of fire, this is what you do. But they need to, we need to be better at training children to be prepared for unanticipated, unfamiliar situations. That's something we really need to work on, uh, according to ROSPA. Um, and as we've said, being aware of your bias, I think if you're aware of what your subconscious bias is and what makes you feel uncomfortable, uh, you can work much better with that, you know, and you can put things in place. So like talking to other people, getting different perspectives on it. Um, and thinking about the context and the needs of particular children. I mean, sometimes I will find I go to settings and, you know, and they're using risk assessments from another setting. That's fine, but they do need to be adapted. Uh, and that does need to be a dynamic working document that everyone understands uh, and they're on board with it. Because I do sometimes find as well, well, you know, one person's got one rule and somebody's got another rule. So I went somewhere where children weren't allowed by one member of staff and one part of the playground, but there was no real there were some low steps there which the children could actually manage but the children were very sophisticated they knew when that person was on on duty they weren't to go there but everyone else allowed them so it's that sort of consistency really um, I mean starting with the benefits like I said and then moving on to those risks and thinking about whether those risks are justified um, but having trust in children really uh, and having high expectations of them so try not to immediately step in to help. I know I can sometimes have that sort of fear in the pit of my stomach, you know, when a child is climbing, for example, um, but really thinking carefully about, you know, how safe they are and communicating the whole time with them. I mean, I've been absolutely amazed, you know, with two-year-olds recently and three-year-olds working with them with tools, you know, exactly the, the reverence that they have for tools and the respect uh, and, and how sensible they can be, uh, which is brilliant. I mean, really being positive with children about it. So not, you know, always say, saying stop, be careful, you know, using that positive language to to show that you believe in them and you feel that they are capable. It's really good links with self-determination theory, you know, for well-being, children need to feel that they are capable. They've got that level of autonomy and they've got that relatedness. So they've got us there as, you know, those warm relationships to support them as they're becoming more independent. So giving them as many problem solving opportunities as they can, really. Mm. Yes, completely. And I think the same outdoors, I think the same indoors, you know, it's like when a, a child says, I want to do some baking and sometimes like, oh, the mess. Yeah. <laughs> you have to take a deep breath and let them. I can remember my son sending, getting up as he randomly does. He's 15, but he'll say, I want I want to do some baking today. And we were going out for a walk and I, I said, well, you know where everything is. I knew that I was going to come back to an absolute nightmare <laughs> of a mess and I did he didn't let me down you know he'd used every possible <laughs> piece of equipment you might want to but there in amongst it was sat <laughs> this cake it was quite creative he'd put a Maltesers packet kind of hovering above using a Amazing. yeah and um but it is allowing them to go and make mistakes as well as long yeah. as they're not dangerous mistakes they need to sometimes we we try, I think, so often to prevent the, the mistakes and the failures happening. And this can be an outdoor, but it can be an academic learning as well. We we try and intervene too early. And I think our children do need to make those mistakes and then learn from those. And I wonder sometimes now, and there's lots of talk about the lack of resilience and that um, 
young people want spoon feeding and sit and wait for direction but I just wonder how much is because we haven't let them work things out for themselves through failure and I think it's time isn't it and a lot of practitioners are feeling you know more and more pressure and we sometimes don't feel we've got time to enable children to get mastery of certain things um, so, I mean, I, I see in early years, you know, a child will need to do something over and over again to mask that skill, whether it's indoors or outdoors. And if they don't get that sufficient time to do that, you really see that gap, you know, when I'm teaching them as they're older. Um, and I, I think it's sometimes we have this pressure, I think particularly in the UK, to be productive all the time. They've got a lovely phrase in Croatia, fiaka, which is that kind of taking it slow, taking a break from things, really, uh, and just being in the moment. And I think as educators, you know, it can feel a bit like, you know, you're on a conveyor belt, you've got to be busy all the time. Uh, but it's just taking that time sometimes or feeling as a practitioner that you are allowed to do that. Mm. Definitely. So moving back to you, Sarah, now, just as, as we wrap up, what has been your greatest achievement to date, would you say, in your career? Difficult question, I know. It's a really difficult question to answer, yeah. I mean, I suppose um, in some ways I think about certain children um, that I've helped. I mean, you always, it preys on your mind, the children that you know, perhaps left and, and you don't know what happened to them. You know, they've been through a very difficult circumstance. I always think about those children, but there are certain children that you made a difference with. So whether it was, you know, supporting someone to pass their GCSE English, which can be life changing, you know, or, you know, supporting a child in early years who suffered a great deal of neglect, you know, when they were very young and supporting them to to build a better life for themselves, really, you know, working with their families very closely. Um, on a more sort of concrete level, I'd say uh, writing my first book, it's quite research led in a sense. Oh, my goodness. There were certain periods of time. So when they approached me, I was thinking, oh, this is a great opportunity. You know, and I've got loads to say about play. You know, I feel like I know a lot about this. The more researchers I spoke to and experts in the area, I thought, gosh, there's so much I don't know. And there were certain points where I thought, why did I take this on? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I was really proud of it when it was finished. But the, and also there's that time, though, when it was published, where I, I felt terrified about how it would go down and what people would think of it, um, because it's it involves the stories of children uh, and experts and so on. And I didn't want to let people down. Mm. That certainly felt like a, a, a real achievement. Yeah. Yeah. Or I think it is and the pain to get there. <laughs> you have to celebrate the achievement at the end. I've been there. Pain, that's, that's so true. There was definitely <laughs> some pain involved. <laughs> it is. Um, and is there an ambition or something that you still hope to achieve? Well, I think this is linked, really. I've always wanted to uh, write a picture book. Uh, I, I feel like I'm actually putting it out there now. So perhaps <laughs> I'll have to do something about it. Um, I mean, I've got an idea that I'd really like to pursue, um, but it, it just feels such a big challenge to me, really. So I'm not sure whether it will actually become a reality at some point, but I would love to do that. Excellent. Well, we will look out for that. Sarah, it's been a delight chatting away to you and I followed you for a long long time on on Twitter and our paths have crossed on social media so it's just been a delight to um chat with you face to face today and of course people can follow you on Twitter and you're at mini underscore Lebowski that's it yeah. Twitter handle I will put this in in you know with the the notes for the podcast and is that the best way because I know you do lots of independent work advising and working with schools um around outdoor play and um, early years education as well. Is that the best way for people to get hold of you if they just pop onto your Twitter and send you a, a message? Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, I mean, I've got a LinkedIn um, account as well, but I think, yeah, lots of people get in touch with me via Twitter. That's probably the most straightforward way. Brilliant. So if you are interested and, and uh, want uh, to have Sarah to yourself, and advising on anything that you do do drop her a line but follow her as well and you can as I said before find Sarah's publications on um, the Bowden Education website under our recommended reading page as well as uh, Sarah's Nursery World article is our reading of the month so if you go to our reading of the month page it will link you out to the Nursery uh, World article that we've referred to in this so thank you so so much Sarah it's been an absolute delight. Thank you so much Catherine I've really enjoyed it. <laughs>